This video is sponsored by TrueFire. Over 2 million guitar players worldwide improve their playing using TrueFire's online lesson systems. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Art World. We're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. In 1963, I took the train over the Delancey Street Bridge from Lower Manhattan to get replacement screws for my two pickup, three control, no selector switch Corvette. Well, actually, the first time I went there was on a Saturday, and they were closed. The next time was on a holiday. They were closed. The third was a success. I was off from Catholic school for a religious holiday, and bingo, they were open. And I was 14 at the time. I waited in the reception area while one of the employees came out and handed me about nine screws. I needed two. I peeked into the workshop and saw a ton of unfinished country gents waiting to be painted. And I still remember that smell to this day. When I made the Gretsch Duo Jet video, a gentleman from New York City left one of the best comments I've ever had on a video. So when it came time to make this video, I reached out to Johnny Gretsch Padula and asked him to share that Gretsch memory from their golden era, which he graciously did. As I said in the Duo Jet video, I've mostly admired Gretsch guitars from afar, and I think of them as being in two disparate stories, the solid body and the hollow body story. But since there isn't time for all the hollow body Gretsch guitars, this is the 5 Watt World short history of the flagship model, the 6120. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store to grab a t-shirt or a hat to support what we're doing here. And if you don't need another hoodie or a hat, but want to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, think about becoming a member of the Friends of 5 Watt. The links are in the description. Oh, and in response to requests, I've added a tip jar, so if you just can't wait, that's there as well. Gretsch was founded in 1883 by Friedrich Gretsch. The 27-year-old German immigrant opened shop on 128 Middleton Street in Brooklyn, New York to make tambourines and drums. They continued making instruments there to some success until 1894 when they moved to a larger space on South 4th Street. Sadly, Friedrich died the next year, leaving the company to be run by his wife and then 15-year-old son Fred. As the saying goes, Fred put his back into it, and by 1916, they were in their fourth factory building, the 10-story Gretsch Building No. 4. Fred Gretsch Sr. turned the company over to his son, Fred Jr., in 42. After serving as a commander in the Navy during World War II, Fred Gretsch Jr. returned to run the company until it was eventually sold to Baldwin in 1967. So it was Fred Jr. that ran the company throughout the period when its name would gain a prominent entry in the history of American instrument manufacture. Getting home from World War II with the other GIs, Fred would find himself in one of the strongest periods of consumer spending growth in the 20th century. This prosperity would propel Gretsch to immense success through their golden years of 1953 to 1965, running parallel with the transformation in popular music. In the early 50s, Perry Como, Rosemary Clooney, and Frank Sinatra sang popular jazz with a newfound post-war optimism, while at the same time, the guitar was a driving force in the growing popularity of the blues of Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker. Les Paul was paving new roads in instrumental jazz, another spiritual successor to the big bands, and with his new solid body guitar and studio wizardry. And at the start of the 50s, Nashville electric guitar heroes Merle Travis and Chet Atkins were making waves in country and western, while West Coasters Jimmy Bryant, Buck Owens, and Joe Maphis created their own sound. Johnny Cash, Buddy Knox, and Carl Perkins were forging rockabilly, not quite rock and roll, and certainly not the country music that was at its roots. It would have an impact on Eddie Cochran and Elvis Presley, and though not overwhelmingly popular in its moment in the 50s, it would have a long shadow of impact that stretches to the present day. Rock and roll with its blend of southern blues, gospel, and a strong backbeat expressed the feelings of this new market of teenagers. In 1956, Warner Brothers lit the motion picture screens of the world with the dramatic force and fire of James Dean's Rebel Without a Cause, a story that daringly met the challenge of the day's most vital controversy. Well, okay, maybe that's a little bit dramatic, but it really did encapsulate the frustration and struggle for identity among the children of the GIs. These young people had some discretionary income, brought about by the boom times they were living in. The electric guitar was quickly establishing itself as the voice of the era, and at the turn of the decade, we saw solid body guitars in the Fender Broadcaster in 1950 and the Gibson Les Paul in 1952 move to prominence. The growth and role of television during this period should not be discounted. 
For the first time, products could be seen on a screen, and by 1956, Dick Clark was hosting American Bandstand on ABC, where musical acts were featured along with local kids from Philadelphia who were shown dancing to the bands. Bandstand would be at the heart of the late 50s teen culture, portraying music, fashion, and celebrity of the era. Musicians on TV, singer-songwriters, would be shown singing their songs while accompanying themselves on guitar, and this drove the demand for guitars as much as the appearance of the Beatles or Rolling Stones on The Ed Sullivan Show nearly a decade later. And this is where Jimmy Webster makes his dramatic entrance. Born in Ohio in 1908, by 1930 Webster had moved to New York City where he did what musicians do to get by, a little bit of everything. He was a professional piano tuner, ran a small music store, and he began consulting with the Gretsch Company. He served in the U.S. Air Corps as a musician during World War II, and after the war moved to Long Island and ended up working with Gretsch. Gretsch entered the 50s with their third generation Electromatic Series electric archtop guitars, already having some maturity, all sharing Dynasonic pickup technology. According to Tony Bacon's 50 Years of Gretsch Electrics, the new models were shown off at a special three-day promotional event in New York in January of 1951, where Jimmy Webster demonstrated the new line. These models were referred to as the 6185. Now, it's worth pausing here to say that trying to find a line of reasoning and Gretsch numbering over the years can only lead you to madness. I'm sure it made perfect sense to someone at the time, but in hindsight, it's kind of a mess. I've mentioned these models because they point the way to where our story will start to pick up momentum in 1954 and begin the golden era of Gretsch guitars. Jimmy Webster had established himself as Gretsch's idea man, and 1954 was his year. He led Gretsch in implementing custom colors, the first company to do so with its Cadillac Green, Jaguar Tan, and Copper Mist. It was also his idea to use the laminates from the drum division to cover the tops of the duo jets and create the silver jet guitars. And that year at the Summer NAMM show, Webster unveiled his ultimate dream guitar, the White Falcon. Originally created as a guitar of the future and built as a concept guitar for the NAMM show, the dealer reaction was so overwhelming that Gretsch had to relent and add the guitar to their 1955 lineup. It remains to this day one of the most rarefied and prestigious guitars you can buy. Flailing in the wake of Gibson's success with Les Paul as an endorser, Webster set his sights on Chet Atkins for Gretsch's first signature model guitar. At first, Atkins resisted. He was still happy playing his own self-modified D'Angelico guitar, but Atkins would eventually give in to Webster's promise to let Chet design his own model guitar. The result of that collaboration would be the now legendary Chet Atkins Hollowbody Model 6120. The first prototype guitar that was sent to Atkins in mid-1954 was sort of a special order streamliner model. The guitar was given a second D-arm and Dynasonic pickup, a lightly figured maple top, it had a 21 fret fingerboard and golden hardware, including Gretsch's Melita bridge, arrow control knobs, and Waverly oval tuner buttons. Now let's remember, Gretsch was based in Brooklyn and may have had some interesting ideas about what a guitar from Nashville based artist should look like. So it was that the distinctive amber red that faded to a transparent orange, a large G was branded into the face of the guitar, a steer's head was inlaid on the unbound headstock, it was equipped with gold arrow control knobs and a fancy belt buckle style tailpiece and cactuses and steer heads etched on the block markers of a rosewood fingerboard. There are images of the original pickguard being tortoise with the subtle Chet Atkins signature, but by the time it got to production there was the gold lucite Chet Atkins signature signpost pickguard. Atkins actually didn't care for the kitschy country details, and as he and the guitar became more popular, he slowly had them removed from the later models. Atkins generally approved the guitar, but requested a Bigsby vibrato be added along with a brass nut for better sustain. A second prototype was quickly created, and this is the one that's thought of as the first 6120 Chad Atkins hollow body guitar. This guitar had the fixed arm Bigsby B6 and an aluminum Bigsby bridge, a fancier maple top, brass nut, and the gold lucite pickguard. There's footage of Atkins playing his 1954 hit, Mr. Sandman, on that guitar. It has the gold pickguard, but not the signpost signature insignia or Gretsch logo of later models. The second guitar was likely also a modified streamliner model from the factory, as it still had 21 frets on the neck. And once the 6120 began being produced, the streamliner remained in the line as a mid-priced alternative for those unable or not wanting to spend all the way up for a 6120. By the time the production guitar was ready, Atkins had requested a 22 fret neck with a 24 and a half inch scale. The body was 15 and a half inches wide, though the catalog listed it as 16, and was two and three quarters inches deep. 
Gretsch was in the habit of building guitars in batches of 50 or 100 units. And with these additions, Gretsch began producing the model in late 1954 and began selling them early in 1955. At the time, Fred W. Gretsch said, Our ability to create a partnership with Chet Atkins and use his playing skill and his feel for the instrument to translate our skills into making what a player needs created that 6120. When the guitars were released, they listed for $385. The guitar represented everything that Gretsch had learned about making hollow body guitars in the previous 15 years. So unlike many of the show starters we often talk about in these short stories, everything came together quickly, and on the wave of Atkins' broad popularity, the guitars sold well right out of the chute. As Ed Ball put it in his book, Gretsch 6120, A Legendary Guitar, the legend had begun. Gretsch had a history of constantly improving and tweaking the guitar models, and this continued with the 6120, such that it's almost in a state of constant change coming from the factory, which amusingly causes frustration among the vintage guitar collecting community. There were even cases where changes would be introduced in the middle of a batch of guitars, making it particularly hard to date the specific features to a specific production run. Add to that the commonplace use of parts from earlier batches. Models received as, say, in 1958 may well have been built as a part of a parts run of guitars in 1957. Gretsch was so aggressive in modifying their guitar features that they changed more often than they did the printed catalogs. So you can't look to the catalogs as gospel either. I've lost track of the number of interviews where I've read where a studio guy from Nashville adds, and I'm still looking for the right Gretsch, by which they almost always mean a version of the 6120. Jason Laughlin, who's playing the music on this episode, put it simply, saying that you have to find one you like, and then you take it to an expert and make it the way you want it. Given the success of the new model, it might seem surprising to learn that there were only three batches of 6120s produced for 1955. But you have to put this into context. The Brooklyn factory at the time was only capable of producing 2,000 guitars a year, and eight other Gretsch models were also being produced, also in multiple batches. At the time of the first batch in late 1954, there were also 25 Chet Atkins solid body guitars as part of a batch of jet guitars being manufactured at the very same time. It was also during this first batch that the 21 fret fingerboard transitioned to 22 frets. Notably, Eddie Cochran's 1955 would come from only the second batch of 6120s ever produced. For this reason, guitars from that batch are very desirable in the vintage market. Cochran produced hits as early as 1956, but it was his 1958 Summertime Blues that made him an international star and influence to the likes of Jeff Beck and Pete Townsend. Dwayne Eddy turned out a string of instrumental records with a classic tone that would long be associated with Gretsch, the twang. This came from concentrating on playing melodies on the bass strings of his de equipped 6120 and his use of the Bigsby. He purchased his 6120 brand new on September 20th, 1957. By 1956, the change had continued with a move from the gold anodized Big B to a simple aluminum model, and it changed the original bullet truss cover. Also, during 56, the fixed arm Big B moved to a Dwayne Eddy style swivel handle design. There was also a move to a plain, unetched block fingerboard marker. Never a fan of the large Gretsch F holes, Atkins asked for a guitar with a solid top, and Gretsch, in a moment of simple genius, just painted smaller F holes onto the top. There is a rare prototype from 1956 in black and gold like this, and there are pictures of Atkins with the guitar from that year as well. 1957 saw a more pronounced move away from the Western styling. The brand, or engraved G, both types have been seen, was removed from the face of the guitar. There was a move to the G control knobs. The color was toned down a little and shifted to being a bit more brown, and the new hump block markers made their debut. 1958 was a big year for both internal and external changes to the model. The year started with the hump block inlays, but transitioned to what Gretsch called their neoclassical fretboard inlays, which most people refer to as thumbnail markers. Inside, Gretsch added a trestle bracing running across both the top and back of the guitar. The trestle bracing improved sustain, but it also reduced feedback. This was added along with the move to the new pickup design that was coming in 58, the new Filtertron pickups. The Filtertrons were produced in-house at Gretsch, but had been developed by inventor and Gretsch consultant Ray Butts. From the beginning, Atkins had not liked the Dynasonic pickups, saying that they were bass heavy and lacked the sort of top end he wanted while all the time humming terribly. Ray Butts, who had designed the famous Echosonic amp, took the approach of wiring two coils out of phase to cancel the hum, and this won over Atkins immediately. Some have suggested that this was in response to Gibson's move to humbucking pickups, but there's photographic evidence of Atkins playing guitars equipped with prototype pickups even earlier. 
Atkins asking for the new pickups seemed to have coincided with grumbling at Gretsch about DeArmin selling pickups to much less prestigious brands as well. Add to that a chance to build their own pickups in-house, management moved the project forward, and in 58, that became the year of the Filtertron at Gretsch, crossing the entire line. The pickup covers were emblazoned with the words, Patent Applied For, and these would be there until 1960 when the actual patent number would appear after the patent was approved. Also in 1958, the tone knob was removed from the lower bout, and a second switch was added above the strings, providing three discrete tone settings. This switch, affectionately named by users, the mud switch, had three settings. In the top setting, there was the most substantial roll-off of treble. The middle had no roll-off, and the lower position had about half the roll-off of the top position. In the earliest days of the 1970s, Poison Ivy of the psychobilly band The Cramps played in 1958-6120. The Chet Atkins signature lineup was expanded in 1958 with the introduction of a single pickup Tennessean model, 6119. With a cherry red finish and a single bridge Filtertron pickup, unbound fretboard, and a unique black signpost signature pickguard. That 1959-6120 saw the addition of the zero fret, which Gretsch referred to as the fret nut. <laughs> this was a result of Atkins playing style and his desire for a lower action. It was also much easier to dependably set up at the factory. The quickest way to differentiate between a 1959 and a 1960-6120 is the switch to a V cutout Bigsby tailpiece and the move to a shallower 2.5 inch body from the 2 and 3 quarters inches. Famously, Brian Setzer's main 6120 was a 1960 model, and for this reason many fans seek out guitars from that year, but we'll come back to Setzer later on. In 1970, Joe Walsh, that seeming Santa Claus of guitar history, <laughs> gave Pete Townsend a 1960-6120. Townsend remembered, I opened the case, and it was bright orange, and I thought, ugh, it's horrible. I hate it. I went home, went into my studio, plugged it in, and it totally wrecked me out. It's the best guitar I've got now. He went out to use the guitar on the 1971 Who's Next, and said that Won't Get Fooled Again and Bargain are examples of the sound of that guitar into a 1959 Bandmaster amp. You can still see him playing the guitar in the video for this 1985 hit, Give Blood. Though not using the guitar live for obvious issues of feedback, he said he used it as recently as 2005 for his Pete Townsend anthology album. 1961 saw yet another reduction in the body depth to two and a quarter inches, and in 1962 the biggest change yet would come with the new double cutaway design. It would be easy to assume that this was Gretsch mimicking the double cuts from Gibson, but Atkins was actually pushing for the change as he preferred the closed f sole style of the country gentleman guitar. And so the 6120 saw the move to the double cut body style on the new Electone 6120 with sealed F-holes. Though the body remained 15 and a half inches wide, it was further reduced to just two inches deep. Other features of the single cut guitars were retained, the gold pickguard now with a simple signature. There was a new string mute system added like the one found on the Fender Jaguar, which, given how few guitar players use them, sort of defies any explanation other than not all engineers are guitar players. George Harrison started playing a Gretsch when he bought a used 1957 Duojet Salabody for a reported 70 pounds. He went on to play a 1962-6122 Country Gentleman, then a 1963 Country Gentleman, and later that same year a Tennessean that he played at Chase Stadium. Later on you could see Harrison also playing a 1957-6120. Despite appearances, Harrison never had an endorsement deal with Gretsch, but he undoubtedly had one of the largest influences on demand for the guitars. That led to Gretsch ramping up production from their earlier 2,000 guitars a year to 12,000 units annually. Even at that, Gretsch could not keep up with demand. The new Electone style 6120 had small tweaks in the mid-60s. Notably, in 66, there was the addition of a small plaque on the headstock declaring it as the Chet Atkins Nashville model. And that really brings us to the end of the golden years at Gretsch and as we move toward the Baldwin years. The guitar industry was rocked by the sale of Fender in 1965 for 13 million dollars. It was by far the most money ever paid for a guitar company to date. The Baldwin Organ Company in Ohio had unsuccessfully bid for Fender, so Baldwin now turned its attention to purchasing Gretsch. In 1967, Fred Gretsch Jr. announced to his top management that he was selling the company to Baldwin. Baldwin paid approximately 4 million dollars and 10,000 shares of Baldwin common stock. It was announced that Gretsch would become a subsidiary of Baldwin and all existing management would stay in place. This was at a time when Gretsch was grossing in excess of $6 million a year. The 1969 catalog listed the 6120 at $550, a 
about $100 less than the Country Gentleman, and fully half the price of a stereo White Falcon in the same year. So the 6120 had slid into the middle of the product range. The ownership of Gretsch by Baldwin resulted in a number of predictable growing pains, with overall sales dropping by 12% in 1969. So in 1970, in response, Baldwin decided to move Gretsch Manufacturing from their long-standing home in Brooklyn to Boonville, Arkansas. They were looking to cut costs and find a more amenable, maybe desperate, workforce. Of course, almost none of the original workforce moved from New York to Arkansas. So by the early 70s, Gretsch had lost all connections with its roots in the long-standing headquarters at 60 Broadway, Brooklyn. Despite the cost-cutting, Gretsch wasn't making money for Baldwin. America seemed to have moved on from the influence of Atkins and the Beatles, and America's youth were buying up Stratocasters and Les Pauls. In 1972, the 6120 evolved to become the 7660. Gone were the distinctive orange finish, the string mute system, back pad, and seal top. It had a 16-inch body and went back to being 2 and 3 quarters inches deep. The scale was still 24 and 3 quarters, but the neck joined the body at the 18th fret instead of the 14th fret more in the direction of a Gibson 335. There was also the squared off pickguard of the Baldwin era and printed aluminum G Aero control knobs. The gold hardware on the pickguard faded to silver by 1974. Though there were no doubt many fine guitars produced at Baldwin during the 70s, in general they have a reputation as being wildly inconsistent. Atkins had a couple of interesting successes with the Super Chet in 1971, the Atkins Axe and then the Super Axe solid body models in mid 70s. But in 1979, Fred Gretsch Jr. passed away, and Atkins decided it was time to sever the long-standing relationship with Gretsch. He moved to Gibson in the early 80s with his solid body acoustic, and then a country gentleman model in 1986. In the early 80s, Baldwin Parent Company would go bankrupt, and they began selling off its music divisions in the breakup of the company. So in October of 1984, Fred W. Gretsch, the great-grandson of Friedrich Gretsch, had a chance to buy the company back. The deal was finalized and announced in January of 1985. Not only did they not have a manufacturing facility, they didn't have the records of the original guitar specs. So they worked closely with Gretsch expert Duke Kramer and Gretsch collector Randy Bachman of the rock band Bachman Turner Overdrive to produce the first prototypes that would be used to relaunch the brand. To produce the guitars, they made an agreement with Tarada Musical Instruments in Japan. It took a few years to put it all on its feet, and by 1989 the price list offered eight electric archtops and four solid body style guitars. The jewel in this crown was the 6120 Nashville model. Since Atkins was now under contract with Gibson, they could no longer use his name on the model. There were two versions offered, a simple 1960s style and a 6120W, full on country and western which carried the cows and cacti fretboard markers, a G on the face which now was a decal under the finish, and the signpost pickguard with the word Nashville where Chet's name had once been. Both guitars were the original spec 24 and 3 quarter inch scale, 15 and a half inch body, and 2 and 3 quarters inches deep. At this point, Gretsch went looking around for a new endorser to carry the banner. Randy Bachman was known more as a Gretsch collector than a player. Neil Young had played a 6120 with Buffalo Springfield, but was much better known for his use of a White Falcon. Other modern Gretsch users included Martin Gore with Depeche Mode, the Cult's Billy Duffy, and Robert Smith with The Cure but none was really associated with the 6120. But all of this was simply sniffing around the edges of the obvious choice, Brian Setzer. Setzer had bought his first 6120 in the late 70s on Long Island where he'd grown up. Launching the Stray Cats in the summer of 1980, their reception in the States was underwhelming. So they relocated to the UK where they fared better and had a chance to meet artist producer Dave Edmonds. They released their self-titled debut in February 1981. Rock This Town and Stray Cat Struts were hits in Europe, and they came back to the States opening up for the Rolling Stones at the beginning of that American tour. Their look and fresh style of music were perfect for the new MTV music video format, and they were given heavy rotation. Setzer went on to have a very successful solo career as well, in particular with the big band, the Brian Setzer Orchestra. In 2007, the original Stray Cats lineup toured again, and that allowed Setzer to get back to the roots that had led to his success. As mentioned earlier, Setzer's main early guitar was a 1960 6120. But in 1983, Setzer met rock star Steve Miller, and after that meeting, Miller sent him another 1960 6120. Produced in a batch shortly after Setzer's original guitar, it also has the one quarter inch shallower body depth. It also has a fourth control knob that had been added prior to Miller acquiring the guitar. 
In 1988, the guitar, now dubbed the Steve Miller guitar, replaced Setzer's original guitar as his primary road guitar and would serve these duties for 10 years before being retired in favor of the new Setzer Signature Model 6120s. The history of the Setzer Signature Models could fill a short history in themselves, but I'll give you the highlights here. The guitars were based on his original 1960 guitar, with his well-known modifications, Spurzel locking tuners, strap locks, dice control knobs, and a graphite nut. Their promotional materials list them as 16 inches. They're actually closer to a vintage spec at about 15 and 3 quarters. Presumably influenced by the looks of the Steve Miller guitar, the tops were extravagant flame maple. In 1999, the Setzer Hot Rod guitars were released with a single volume knob and in multiple metal flakes show-stopping colors. Others of my modern favorite players can be spotted playing Gretsch guitars. Beatles-loving Mike Campbell, who eventually did a signature model with Duesenberg guitars with very Gretsch-like features and sideman to the stars Richard Bennett, most often seen with Mark Knopfler on the road, is another one who is frequently making unique music with a 6120. There was a Dwayne Eddy signature model in 1997, based on his 1957 guitar with gold hardware and Dynasonic pickups. In 1998, Gretsch released a G6120JR, or Junior, model, with a downside body that was 14 inches wide and 2 and a quarter inches deep, laminate maple and with an ebony fingerboard and neoclassical fret markers. In 2001, there was an Eddie Cochran signature guitar, also based on a 1957, that included a P90 pickup in the neck position. In 2005, a Reverend Horton Heat signature model expanded the rockability credentials of the 6120 in the modern catalog. And in 2004, to celebrate the model's 50th anniversary, a 6120 GA was produced in all-over gold metallic. It's the guitar that Jason Laughlin's been playing throughout this video. Gretchen Fender joined forces in 2002 in an agreement where Fender does the marketing, manufacturing, and distribution, but Gretsch still owns and controls the brand. Fender reworked every model, and they bought up some vintage Gretsch guitars to serve as models for this process, just as they had done when starting their own reissue program in the 80s. FMIC continues to manage the brand, along with Fred W. Gretsch having creative control. Along with the Japanese line, there's also a strong showing of guitars in the Electromatic series in both 16 inches and the junior size bodies that look back at the features from the golden years. On the other end of the spectrum, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the extraordinary guitars coming from the Gretsch Custom Shop in California. These amazing instruments have been showstoppers at recent NAMM shows and represent some of the best guitars ever to wear the Gretsch name. I've partnered with Truefire because I've used them for over a decade and my playing always improves when I put in the time on their lessons. Whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or professional level player, Truefire has lessons to inspire and advance your playing. As you know, I always promote spending money on lessons before new gear. I really like Truefire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Get 25% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 25 or like I have for many years, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. You can sample anything in the catalog with the All Access Pass and see where the muse takes you. I love their tagline. Learn, practice, and play with Truefire. I'd like to thank Truefire for partnering with me and sponsoring this video. Johnny Padula's Gretsch memories are wonderful and vivid, but I do have a Gretsch story of my own. When I moved to Vermont in 2001, I dove into a new job, and I didn't play guitar for about two years. You know how it goes. Sometimes you get so wrapped up in being an adult, we forget who we are. When I finally came up for air, I started hitting the guitar stores in the area and quickly learned that advanced music was the place to go. Sadly, it's been one of the victims of the pandemic and is now closed. They were dealers for Gibson, PRS, and Fender, and along with the Fenders, they carried Gretsch guitars. Back in 03, still hanging on the wall, was one of the 1998 run of 6120 Juniors. With its all-over transparent orange finish and gold, I honestly kind of avoided playing it, but the fact that it was downsized from the original, both smaller and thinner, eventually got to me, and I took it down. Once my favorite salesman, John, gave me some operating instructions for the control layout, I couldn't believe all the great tones I could get out of that guitar. It would do the ACDC thing on the bridge. The Bigsby was balanced and unique sounding, and if I threw it on the front pickup and rolled off the tone, I could get the tones of the early Pat Metheny's records with ease. I took it home, and though it didn't make it through the big guitar purge 10 years ago, I remember it very fondly. As I've worked on these two Gretsch videos, I've become convinced that if it wasn't for the factory's low output and the sale to Baldwin, this company could have done everything that Fender and Gibson had done and they'd have done it in a wonderfully different and unique Gretsch way, if only. If I missed something, or if you have your own 6120 story to share, please put it in the comments for everyone to enjoy. First, I need to thank the extraordinary Jason Laughlin for agreeing to play his 6120 Golden Anniversary guitar for the videos. 
His mastery of these styles shows why his courses for True Fire do so well. Check them out and check out his website via the links in the description. This video would not have been possible without Edward Ball's excellent Gretsch 6120, The History of a Legendary Guitar, and The Gretsch Electric Guitar Book and The Gretsch Book by Tony Bacon and Paul Day. There are a link to the books in the description. I once again need to thank Dave Rogers and his amazing photographer Tim Mullally of Dave's Guitars, this time for the pics of Dave's 56 6120 in the thumbnail and in the video. I need to thank Johnny Gretsch Padula for taking the time to record his memory of visiting the Gretsch factory back in the day. As always, I need to thank our editor, Perry McManus, for cleaning up another jumbled script. He asked me to extend to you happy holidays and a hope for a better 2021. I need to thank all of you that stopped by the store to buy a t-shirt, hoodie, or the Stomp Precept Pack. And in particular, I need to thank the friends of 5 Watt for their continued support of everything we do here at 5 Watt World. You guys are the best. If you enjoyed the short history of the Gretsch 6120, hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that too. Thanks for watching. Until next time, Thanks for being a part of the 5-Watt world.